Good morning to you, Marcus. Hi again, Anna or Anna. <laughs> you can just, you can pronounce it any way you want. So, are you ready? Um, yes, and I can actually see you. Good morning from London, a, a frosty, cold morning in London. Okay. Yes, and we're, we're ready to go, yeah. It's not frosty in Copenhagen. That's a little bit, uh, this, uh, a little bit concerning, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give the word to you and um, I'll enjoy your session. Okay, thank you very much. And we're here this morning to ask the question, is the future beautiful? Talking about beauty in architecture. Is beauty something we should strive for? Is it something that helps people feel better about themselves? Is it something that's even possible in today's economic and social climate? I'm here today with Lorenzo Di Simone from the New European Bauhaus, Mary Parsons from Building Better, Building Beautiful, which is a UK initiative to do exactly that, apparently, and Dana Behrman from UN Studio, which is a Dutch architecture company. I'm just going to introduce them one by one. First of all, uh, Lorenzo, hi there. Morning, everyone. Hey there, Lorenzo. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. I think it's good. Um, okay, great. Is it, Lorenzo, is it already my moment just... to start, or? No, no, no. You don't, don't, don't do your presentation until I until I tell you to. But just first okay. of all, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you do. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, just into words, I'm a, I'm Italian, of course. I'm an architect. Uh, I have some studies in energy and climate from the University of Antwerp. Um, now I work at the European Commission, but I've been working in the architectural design sector for uh, yeah, all of my career, mostly in the field of uh, urban planning and landscaping. And since March 21, I'm part of the European Bauhaus team at JRC. And um, yeah, that's me. And briefly, what is the new European Bauhaus? Uh, yeah, good, uh, good question. So I will have time today to explain a little bit uh, more extensively. But the European Bauhaus is a is a project uh, set out to um, support and design new policy for uh, our built environment and to transfer the targets of the Green Deal into the yeah the living environment. Let's say. Great. And finally, where are you speaking to us from today? From Brussels. From Brussels, of course. Yeah. Ah, OK. The line isn't great. I thought you might be on the moon or something, but it's good to know you're here on planet Earth. Mary, <laughs> okay. same to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. My day job, I'm a, a developer. I've worked in residential development in particular for, for most of my career. Um, I'm speaking today as one of the commissioners for the UK government's Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which I'll talk through in a little bit more detail. Um, and I'm also chair of the Town and Country Planning Association. So very focused on sort of quality and community and development as well. And presumably the Building Better, Building Beautiful initiative aims to do exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah, it was something that when the government announced it uh, was hugely controversial for a variety of reasons. But I think actually as we published the final report, which I'll touch on today, really built a consensus about the need to, to build better, to really think about quality and to think about sustainability in development as well. And finally, where are you speaking from today, Mary? So I'm, I'm speaking from the UK at home in Gloucestershire, so more of a rural link. So hopefully the, uh, the broadband and everything will, will work for the duration of the session. It's sounding pretty good to me. And finally, Dana. Hi, Dana. Hi, good morning. Can you tell Hello? us a little bit about your... Hi, yeah, I can hear you. Tell <laughs> us a little bit about yourself and what you do, please, Dana. Um, I'm an associate director and a senior urban designer at UN Studio. I'm based in Amsterdam, so hello from a very grey morning, very typical morning. Um, UN Studio, we've been around for over 30 years building projects all over the world, uh, but in the past few years we've been really shifting our focus, looking at kind of communities and how do we how do we build for and with people. And that's kind of especially my focus as part of the, the urban team at UN Studio. Brilliant. Well, great to meet you all. We have a pan-European discussion. and uh, each, each of the speakers is going to give a, a short presentation setting out their position on the topic of beauty and what it is and what its relevance is, as well as explaining a bit more about that, what they do. So to kick us off, Lorenzo, could you go first, please, and um, share your screen with us? Um, yes, of course. Um, I think that somebody's sharing my screen already. Yeah, I can see it now, yeah. Okay. 
All right, perfectly. Um, okay, I will just go straight to the point and present you the European Bahas, uh, which is a creative and trans transdisciplinary movement uh, set out to uh, connect the European Green Deal to our living spaces, uh, as I was saying before. And we see it as a platform for experimentation and a connection for thinkers and doers and uh, people who want to design our future ways uh, of living together. Uh, we see it also as a bridge uh, between science and, uh, and technology and the world of art and culture. And I've put here in the first slide uh, the three pillars of the movement that are still after one year from the kickoff of the project, our guiding stars, let's say. So we read uh, beauty as a quality of experience, so not only something that's is aesthetically pleasant and stylish, but also considering what makes people feel uh, good and what makes people feel safe and at home and happy. And with the concept of sustainability, we want to bring uh, to the table uh, future proof solutions that are, for example, flexible and adaptive and that energy efficient and uh, climate resilience. And for the third point, of course, is about uh, living together, uh, being inclusive and socially responsible. And singularly, uh, we can say that these three concepts are nothing new, nothing groundbreaking, uh, but for the first time uh, with the European Bauhaus, uh, the Commission tries to combine combine them and, and apply them to, to policy in an integrated way, uh, both for a matter of content and uh, uh, process. So about the process, just let me go briefly through our uh, timeline. Uh, we started in January 2021 with a so-called uh, design phase and we launched it uh, to gain inputs from the citizens about aesthetical, sustainable and inclusive solutions for our uh, living spaces. And um, the community started to, to gather and to, to grow uh, rapidly after that, and together with, um, with the amount of events and discussions around it. And the, the co-design phase ended in late June, um, and it gathered more than 2,000 uh, contributions from people from all over the world. Uh, from many different sectors and multiple disciplines. And in order to spread uh, the main ideas of the project and keep the conversation alive, we are supported uh, by a growing number of partners. Um, they keep organizing events all around Europe. And we also have the Lever Round Table, which is a group of 18 uh, experts. And these two entities work a little bit uh, like a sandwich. So uh, we have the, the partners that work for the grassroots movements and then the, the, the High Level Round Table uh, from the top for the High Level Thinkers and the worst, uh, let's say. And um, yes. Uh, just two words on the process of, of, of collecting inputs uh, from the citizens. Uh, we used an online tool called SenseMaker um, that was structured to collect examples, ideas and challenges. And all this information were continuously gathered and mapped and screened. And uh, after the co-design phase, they were put somehow together to create the communication. And the communication is um, somehow um, an official policy document of the Commission. It was published in September. Um, and it works a little bit like uh, the Bible of the initiative, where we explain what we retain for the future and um, what we have learned from the, from the co-design phase. Um, we did set uh, some principles that are somehow horizontal, you have them there in the slide. And then uh, I won't go uh, specifically on every one of the axes that we set, but maybe in this conversation it's important to talk about the second point, which is uh, regaining a sense of belonging, uh, as we say, which is um, basically about uh, connecting people together, but also connecting, connecting them with the spirit of the place uh, and its heritage. And this for us also contributes uh, to the creation of uh, beautiful spaces in our cities. And uh, what we want to do is to have an impact uh, on three different levels and somehow be transformative, transform the places on the ground, transform the environments that enables innovation. So in the industry world and the, the way uh, it works and it connects. And also we want to uh, transform our perspectives and our ways of thinking and act directly on mindsets and on way of living, education and uh, culture. So to do that, we have mobilized a number of EU uh, 
funding systems and some uh, calls. And uh, most importantly, I would like to introduce uh, to you uh, today just three actions that are uh, dear uh, to the to the project. Uh, the one, the first one is the NAB Lab, which is basically a, a virtual space that um, will uh, ex try to explore, create, and test new tools, new solutions, and policy recommendations, uh, reaching out to society and uh, to business. And the idea is to prototype uh, projects and support the replication through innovation funding schemes and networking. And then the second thing that I would like to introduce you is the uh, European Bahas uh, Festival, which will take place um, in June. It will work as a discussion forum uh, for partners and interested uh, actors, and then also as a fair, and it will be also organized as a fest to uh, bring people together and be together uh, for once. And then the, the, the last thing is the, the labeling strategy, which, which is the action that I'm following in the unit, um, which is basically the design of a self-assessment tool for quality of architecture that will work um, a little bit as a dashboard or a, um, uh, yeah, a dashboard basically, or a list of uh, self-questions that should guide uh, designers or whoever uh, is involved in architecture, for example, or uh, in initiatives to design, uh, to create uh, spaces that are, um, are beautiful, that are sustainable, and also uh, inclusive. Uh, there are a lot of things to say uh, still, so please uh, be in touch following um, our website and our Instagram page. And um, yeah, I'm happy to have more time later for the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Do you want to unshare your screen? Yeah, so um, the new European Bauhaus, obviously the Bauhaus was a really important cultural movement in Europe, but it had a particular aesthetic to it. Does the new European Bauhaus follow the beauty uh, rules established by the original Bauhaus? Does it have a definition of beauty? Um, not really, that's not really the point. As I was trying to say uh, very briefly, um, Mostly, the, instead of setting some kind of uh, criteria for, for beauty, we try to uh, think about it as a, an experience-based uh, thing. So uh, we try to connect what's, to what makes people feel uh, good or safe or, uh, or at home. So it's not necessarily something that has uh, the same aesthetic profiles, but could change uh, uh, in function of the place, for example, of the uh, or its history and its heritage. So it's about the colors of the place and uh, the tradition, for example. So it's not necessarily something statical as the European, as, as the old Bauhaus, of course, but the term Bauhaus is for us just a link to uh, a movement that was transversal, was uh, going uh, from industry to design to architecture to music, etc. And this is what we would like to do. So in other words, you're not setting out any any definition of, of what beauty is. But what if what if what if you were to fund a project and people were to turn around and say that's really not beautiful? Um, yeah, absolutely. We are really not setting any kind of uh, criteria, but for for us, it's really important, as I was saying, to combine the three things. So maybe what is beautiful for the future is also sustainable, for example, or it's also inclusive. So for us, it's really uh, trying to tackle all the three dimensions all together. And um, we, 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 we say that, for example, a building cannot be just compliant to uh, energy regulations, for example, to be future proof, but it also needs to provide uh, a quality um, for the people that, uh, for, for which provides shelter, for example. So uh, I'm just thinking about these new building blocks in our contemporary cities that are, I don't know, all uh, white boxes that are super, um, super compliant, energetically speaking, but maybe they're not giving the, this extra thing to the people that live around them, you know. So um, we're somehow building neighborhoods that are not beautiful. I mean, maybe they are sustainable, but um, they uh, fail in giving people uh, a nice uh, atmosphere and atmosphere. So this is where we're trying to uh, act somehow. Okay. So in other words, beauty is, is an outcome of achieving all the other 
things that a building or a place needs to do. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so we don't treat it as a preset thing, but more likely as a yeah as a result. And what I was trying to say before is really that uh, maybe the, the the future of beautiful is also green, for example. So uh, can something beautiful for the future cannot be sustainable? Uh, is that possible? So we don't think that it's possible, and we uh, try to set these three things all together, and so we work somehow in parallel. And we give uh, voice, we showcase projects that are uh, compliant to, to the three dimensions, let's say. So uh, not only one thing specifically, but all, all of them. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. We'll pick up this discussion in a few minutes. But first of all, let's go Bye. to Mary. Thank you. And I think um, some of the, the, the points we've just heard, I'll, I'll be repeating. I'm going to go very quickly through um, Living with Beauty, which was the final report of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, um, which was established by the UK government at the time. It was an independent commission um, and it reported independently. Um, and this is going to be sort of five minutes or so reflecting over 12 months of work throughout 2019 by a very committed team of people. Um, it started by considering why so many people are new development when they know that we need more homes, um, that we still have a, a housing shortage that is, is still acute in many areas of the country. But the Commission went far wider than that, as was just touched on, you know, it, it was looking at the impacts of climate change. It was thinking about how we tackle inequalities before levelling up became the, the phrase that's top of the political agenda now. And it started from an understanding, even pre-COVID, of that deep correlation between where someone lives and their mental and physical health and well-being. And at the earliest stages, we spent hours debating whether beauty was the right objective. Um, we were challenged that should we just be saying it, it's about quality, would that be easier to define and achieve? But I think everyone involved in the Commission felt that beauty should be a legitimate outcome of the planning system, that quality should not be an aspiration, it should be an absolute prerequisite for any development happening. And beauty is undoubtedly a subjective measure, it is really hard to define. But it isn't about architectural style, which is what I think a lot of people thought the Commission was going to be discussing. Um, when we tell someone about somewhere special we've seen, we don't say, you know, I've just seen the most high quality, well designed, sustainable development. We would say, oh, I've just seen a really beautiful place or a beautiful building. So we instinctively know what beauty is. And it's not just what it looks like, as, we, as we've just heard with the European Bauhaus. It's that wider spirit of a place, something that feels right and feels like it belongs and that it lifts your spirits when you're there. And I can't remember who said it during the commission, but someone said beauty is like a smile. If you're asked to describe it, it's really difficult, but you know what one is when you see it and it makes you feel good. And this is a quote I've used many times if we're, if we're trying to define it. Um, a lot of it is that memory of a place, that sense of belonging it gives you. And, you know, again, if I asked you to close your eyes and think of a beautiful place, it would be the memories of what you were doing in that place that would really spring to mind. You know, who you were with, how you were feeling, what was the sounds, the colour. It's all of the senses. Um, and one thing that I really did learn from the Commission, that it's the beauty of everyday life that's really important. It's not a statement of, of high art, that people want to live in beautiful places and live next to beautiful places. So the Commission actually considered beauty at three scales. Yes, we looked at beautiful buildings, but that isn't just one architectural style versus another, it's that it's the right design in its context. We really focused on how spaces in between buildings work and then it, it being beautifully placed, making sure that development happens in the right sustainable locations and that it feels like it belongs and it respects its landscape, which sounds obvious but actually it doesn't always happen and particularly with all of the discussion we've had with with cop 26 and so on with climate change really at the top of the agenda we have to develop in a more sustainable resilient and respectful way and we talk a lot about at place level you know 20 minute neighborhoods mixed use communities garden villages that offer a better 
quality and way of life. But all of the evidence, as one report that was published um, at a similar time to the Commission, suggests we're still creating car-dependent commuter dormitories. We have to think about how people will need to live in the, their communities in the future. And one of the hardest things that we were reconciling was a government committed to beauty and setting us off on a commission that was also extending permitted development rights, allowing redundant offices and warehouses and so on to be converted to homes. And this example, thankfully, didn't happen um, because an inspector stopped it at appeal, noting that living without windows was not a positive living environment which really is stating the obvious. So we've got the government has since moved on minimum standards and ensuring things like light and so on. But actually, they're also extending permitted development rights. So I think there's still some tensions and conflicts there. So the Commission made 45 policy recommendations around these eight themes, which you'll be glad to know I'm not going to go through today, but please do have a look at the report, because they're not just about the planning system, but how we procure, how we fund and how we deliver new places and even the tax regime that surrounds the property industry. Um, that we need to remove the speculation from the planning system that drives down quality and only seems to benefit the financial uh, returns to the landowner, that we shift the development model from only thinking about um, short-term profits to thinking about long-term investment and value creation, that we broaden the education and skills for the professions so that people don't work in silos, and that we involve communities fully and democratically in the future of their area. But perhaps above all, that we stop talking about house building and units, and we talk about placemaking and creating homes. So the government um, published its full response 12 months after the report was published. It has introduced beauty into the national planning policy framework. Uh, so it is a benchmark uh, for development and it has empowered planning authorities to refuse schemes that are deemed ugly. Um, it did launch its um, planning white paper to look at a fundamental reform of the planning system, but actually that's hit the buffers because of public reaction to it. And I think it perhaps didn't heed one part of the report that for too long, one of the issues has been that people feel development is done to them. It's not done with them and they rarely feel that it's for them. So we really do have to think about that democracy in the places. And just to conclude, we, we published the report two months before COVID hit and we went into the first lockdown. And sadly, two weeks after our original chair, Sir Roger Scruton, died. And so looking back now through post, a post-COVID lens, do, does what we're saying really hold true? And I think it does, because every single one of us has experienced our homes in a different way. We've had to work, learn, exercise, spend 24 hours a day there. And our home needs to be our anchor and our sense of permanence in a very, very um, challenging world. It's where we put down roots. It's where we find peace. So I think we need to make sure now, um, and I think a real focus for the conference is we're creating homes that fully understand that fundamental need that they meet. And um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And you touched on it then. You said there was a sort of a public reaction or a public backlash to this this idea that um, people feel that development is in, imposed on them. But also, how how can we create a consensus? If you seem to be saying a similar thing to Lorenzo, that um, beauty is an outcome of getting everything right rather than a, a stylistic decision. But how can you get people to agree on that? Because obviously the property developer, a beautiful development is the one that makes the most money rather than the one that is the most environmentally friendly or that has the most happy residents. I think there is an increase in awareness of the link between the two that actually um, you do create value by uh, creating the kind of environments that people want to live in. Um, so I think the biggest pushback to the Commission was perhaps by the architectural profession to start with, that they felt that for a start, none of the commissioners were architects by background. 
Um, we did have a team of advisors that, that involved them. But I think once the report was published and people understood actually what we were saying, it, it was this thing about doing it right, that the development model um, is, is very much how much does it cost, how much can we sell it for today, and that's the end of it. Whereas the most successful places commercially that we were looking at um, did derive a premium because they put that investment in quality in early. Um, and, and that sort of generated those returns for, for the developer, for the landowner, but also for the residents over time. And um, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Lorenzo. I mean, obviously, um, if you take it that style isn't part of beauty, um, but you could, so, you, so therefore, could you create a, a development that ticked all the boxes in terms of sustainability and people were happy and, and things like that, but was a kind of neoclassical style and then you could do one next door to it which was a brutalist style and they, they both perform the same but look very very different does does, does beauty do, do, is one of them no more beautiful than the other and what about the kind of aesthetic clash between the two of them i i i, I struggle to find that you can't leave aesthetics out of this conversation no i, I mean i think it, i think it's true i think that sense of belonging is the important thing because you can have a very, very modernist development that is absolutely right in the context it's being developed. You know, we shouldn't be building things where everything looks like it, it was built 200 years ago. You know, this isn't about a pastiche or a neoclassical style. It is getting it right for the context that it's been developed in. And some of the, you know, I, I live in an area where design coding um, has been in place for a long time in the Cotswolds. So it's an area of outstanding natural beauty. And there's been a lot of new development. Uh, a lot of it has gone through on planning appeals, but they've all followed the code and actually everything is a lovely quality without doubt you know you walk down a street scene it really works but actually the vast majority of it you really can't tell one developer from the other because they've all followed the same pattern book and i find that a little bit disappointing because i think you have those moments of delight where you see something that still works in its context uses the right materials but does it in a way that really makes a statement about when it was, was built and when it was developed. And actually, around where I live, the one development that did it was a retirement complex. And it's an incredibly modern um, architecture, but it's absolutely compliant with the design code. So I think you can, you know, still use imagination. We need to make sure that actually by, by looking at things like codes, they, they're not just there to prevent the worst from happening. They need to still enable those real surprises, those, those fantastic designs that are those memorable ones. Um, and I think some of the examples that, that we looked at, you know, going across, across the whole of the UK, they were the ones that were the most memorable. And final question for you, you were talking about, you know, in the UK, we do tend to build um, housing developments that you need a car to get through. There's there's, there's no services there um, in particular. Now, in the neighbourhood I live in, in, in North London, the council has put in the low traffic neighbourhood. The idea is to stop cars cutting through residential streets to, to make a shortcut on their way to wherever they're going. And that's caused huge controversy. Yeah. So clearly, um, there are some people that think a beautiful street is one where the children can play safely. And there's another... Uh, bunch of people that think a beautiful street is one you can drive down as fast as you want to get to where you need to go. <laughs> How do you reconcile those completely different views? I, I mean, I think there must have been an awful lot of highways engineers and designers whose ears were burning during the commission because actually that was one aspect that we felt would, would make or break a place. Um, and I think we have to give alternatives for people it's not enough to say you know that you can walk and and cycle everywhere um we've got to put that investment in breaking that connection to the car and i i think you know we're not necessarily looking at, at it right i i quote things like parking standards um we we now will quite often have planners driving down the number of parking spaces which actually then people still own cars so they park them on streets and they stop children being able to cross safely. We need to separate um, car ownership and car usage. 
and in the first instance, give people real alternatives. I think I work on large scale developments. You know, it, 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 what I do, it can be up to 10,000 new homes and new infrastructure. The first thing that's always sorted is the roads. You know, the getting people in and out there, enabling congestion and that to be tackled. And until we start really putting that infrastructure investment into the right kind of infrastructure that will enable people to have more sustainable choices, it's always going to be that tension that you've described where you live. Hey, thank you very much. I didn't realise this was a conversation about beauty. I will go back to our neighbourhood forums with a new, a new take on that. <laughs> thank you. And finally, to you, Dana, if you could um, share your presentation with us now, please. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Mary, for the very insightful um, presentation. There are many elements in it that I also uh, will touch on and, and hopefully will develop. I think you can see my screen. Yeah. Yes. This is not my slide. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say I recognize that picture. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, I think what, what we've heard from the, the past two speakers is uh, clearly um, that we, of course, live in uh, completely different times and, and we design for it, a completely different world uh, that we did, uh, you know, dec decades ago, even, even a few years ago. Um, and, you know, from our side, we, we really um, recognize that, that we live in times of raising awareness, you know, for civic participation, for the voice of the users, for the, the need to form communities uh, that can support us uh, in, in dire times and, and also in our day-to-day -day life. Um, and, and we see that coming from governments, from organizations, from municipalities, uh, but there's also, of course, a great push from, from the people. And, and we see how people are using, of course, public spaces, how they still uh, need to come together in a very physical space um, and share ideas and, and find uh, common common feelings and, and common, as, as, as Mary said, this kind of identity or kind of uh, create with that kind of memories of, of places. Um, so these movements of people, they are, they are unlocking ideas that we as designers see ideas that relate very much to, to how we design cities and how we provide public space um, for people to, to come together and to, to create this kind of identity of, uh, of who they are and where they belong to. Especially, of course, after COVID, where we kind of discovered that uh, our balconies or just one meter away from our doorstep has, has become an extension of our living rooms, an extension of our safe places. And there is this kind of a need and, and a joy in, in celebrating the, this public space. So this gives us a whole new brief, in a sense, of how to look at really each and every small part of, of the city and, and even places that we have you know, maybe neglected or unloved before, um, we now find the opportunity to, to turn them into a place where people can, can come together. But it's not just us as designers. Um, we at UN Studio have really turned this kind of idea of participation, of, of users' engagements into a design tool um, and turn that into a, really a methodology of how we approach each and every project. And I think it's important to talk about this process because you know, often with our international experience as designers in general, not just in Sudi, all of us, um, we tend to bring our experience around the world. But we always ask ourselves the question, what makes our design relevant to that place itself? Um, and it's beyond just the style, beyond just um, kind of the image of the place. It is really about the meaning of the links between people and, and really the forming of communities in that place. So we have a small toolbox that we have created that uh, we really try to kind of follow in each and every project. And, and this toolbox um, really touches on the concepts of inclusivity, health and well-being, of course. Uh, resiliency is extremely important. Um, and that kind of concept of uniqueness and, and connectivity. And this is all under the, you know, kind of the umbrella of uh, sustainability. If, if we talk about environmental sustainability, in this talk, I want to focus on more kind of social sustainability and how, how do we allow people to come together. Um, in just a few examples of our very recent work um, in Penang, 
We've uh, come up with a proposal for a new development, quite large, three large islands. Um, and the concept of inclusivity and empowerment comes actually from a, a digital system that we have developed for this uh, for this place. Um, UN Studio has a sister company called Join Sense. We work in collaboration with them, and they look at technology in the built environment. And I think what's interesting is that it is not about technology that is in your face that is plastered on every building or every billboard. It is really embedded within the, the development. Um, so it is part of, of really the, the bricks and, and, and every element in the development. Um, and it allows people to connect with one another um, and also allows us to really understand the environment that we are that we are proposing with a digital twin and, and really tracking down the kind of the the levels of, of, uh, of air pollution or um, any other mobility, any kind of elements that we can track in order to optimize uh, public spaces to allow um, those children, as you mentioned, uh, you know, to play in a safe space. Jumping into another place, the idea of well-being and health. We have just uh, now starting to build this um, health uh, neighborhood in Milan. Um, and in this in this instance, we really wanted to focus on public spaces, kind of allowing nature um, to come in back into our cities and allowing people to really interact um, interact with, with nature. Um, so if we talk about aesthetics or, or beauty, we really try to bring back this kind of element of kind of the beauty of nature. Um, and then with that um, influence or impact, uh, the way people uh, feel in, the, in that uh, specific neighborhood. So it's not just about the program. Incidentally, it is. Uh, it does have hospitals and clinics there, but um, the idea of health that comes out of the building and really jumps into the, the public space. And uh, Brentwood Smart District is a long-running uh, project in, uh, in Helmond in the Netherlands. We are building uh, the smartest neighborhood in Europe, let's hope so. Um, it is all about participation in this project, and that's what's so exciting about it. If we talk about the concept of beauty, it is about, in a sense, negotiation between future users about what this place would look like. Of course, how it will also perform in terms of sustainability and resiliency, um, water retention, energy production. Um, but in, in this instance, the community has been involved from the first day of this project, from the concept of this project, and has been helping us, the designers, um, to really uh, realize what this space is going to be. So it's kind of a humbling process for us as designers. We are not fully in control. We are more facilitators um, of people's um, ideas and their imagination of the place in order to create this kind of connection to the place in the future. Yeah, so that's kind of this as well. Here you can see images of our endless amount of participation processes that we've been doing um, that for us really talk about kind of the concept of adaptability and resiliency for the future. Um, this has been going on for five years now. The plans have changed continuously uh, because new voices, new people come in with their ideas of what this place uh, could be, always based on you know, the concept of, of resiliency, um, social, environmental, and economical resiliency. Um, but it is really the people themselves who, who have the, opportun the opportunity not just to respond by, as you see here on the left, voting on, on, a, on a proposal, but actually designing um, and really imagining together with us what, what their home will look like. And when we talk about uniqueness and connectivity, um, Mary also talked about it, a memory of a place. Here's an image of a, of a sailor sail, who sails out of Rotterdam where we designed the Erasmus Bridge, an, an icon of the city. Um, and, and when people tattoo our buildings or our neighborhoods on their backs, for us it means that uh, they feel connected. Um, and, and this place is kind of iconic place, kind of left an image and left a a lasting impression that actually defines their identity um, and they well they take them wherever they go so that's kind of um, our our goal achieved <laughs> I have to say we are we're talking here to professionals um, also to designers who are in the audience and, and I think it's important to remember that we are too designers and planners are a community um, here is uh, UN studio about 30 years ago um, and the completion of uh, of the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart. Um, 
UN Studio stands for United Network, and uh, we like to, to work with specialists, with thinkers, with artists, with philosophers, because we, and with, of course, the local community, in order to make our projects uh, much more relevant to their places, healthier, um, and, and more lasting, uh, long, long lasting. And, you know, this is from, from the past month. We, we have grown um, our working kind of togetherness, is, makes our projects uh, better, and, um, and hopefully bring places to communities that, that they could feel their own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. So it seems that we have a consensus that beauty is nothing to do with aesthetics. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you early on in your talk, you mentioned about how during the pandemic, suddenly having outdoor space, having a balcony was considered part of beauty in a way. But that kind of suggests that what beauty is can change. If there's a pandemic, you suddenly need outside space. If 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 there's something else happening, another change in society or whatever, then then you need other needs. So so beauty isn't a constant thing, right? Yeah, I think in a sense we almost need to design less in order to provide more space for people to turn it into their own place, right? So beauty is in a sense, how they feel the city should should look like, right? That, that's in, in a sense the main message that we, we're trying to bring. So it's, it's about designing less and giving less guidelines um, while allowing people the, the opportunity to, to really bring their own personality into this public space. And I think that's what's exciting about cities. They are, they are so diverse and rich um, and we should embrace this plurality and these different voices that come from different people and, and embrace that outcome. It seems there's another consensus amongst all the, the speakers as well that, that beauty, uh, you, in order to achieve beauty, you need consensus, you need to include the people that will live in a space. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I think that that's part of the movement of moving away from these kind of design uh, schools into you know other priorities that we have when it comes to cities. And you also mentioned that architects and designers are themselves a community, but but Mary said that the biggest opposition when they first announced the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission was from the architects. So in a way, does that mean you kind of you've kind of already said this a, a little bit, but do we need less architecture? It is the kind of idea of of architecture and of design and professionals who, who are trained in that and then maybe get obsessed about style. Is that getting in the way of beauty? Uh, on the contrary, I feel that maybe we need more conferences like that where we have an opportunity to talk to more architects and designers and to share more ideas and to, to have people open up to the fact that maybe our egos should be stepped back a bit and uh, we should allow, uh, we should give room to more voices to come, come to the fore. And um, it, I think it's all about communication and it's all about us exchanging ideas in order to understand you know, what, what is best for, for the community and for our built environment. So not less architects, just more open-minded, maybe less egos. <laughs> <laughs> less egos, and maybe a different approach to architecture. Lorenzo, I'd like to ask you a, a similar take on that question. Like, where do architects and designers fit into the, the new European Bauhaus? We've kind of uh, accepted in this discussion that beauty has nothing to do with aesthetics. Architects tend to be very interested in, in aesthetics. How are you engaging with architects and designers? Do they have a role in the new European Bauhaus or are they kind of yesterday's story in a way? Can't hear you, Lorenzo. I'm not sure if you're muted there. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, I was indeed muted. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, um... Uh, our line is really similar to uh, the approach that uh, Dana from UN Studio ha has presented. Uh, so our process is really uh, trying to be participative uh, 100%. So it's not about uh, putting what the European Commission has uh, uh, plans uh, in the center, but more asking to people uh, what is important for uh, for them, what is uh, what are the priorities for the future, and um, we did involve uh, thousands of designers and uh, architects and people coming from the design sector in general uh, during the co-design co phase that lasted about uh, uh, yeah seven months, and we collected a lot 
of uh, impressions from them, a lot of comments, a lot of uh, directions on what this uh, movement should have been about. Um, and we are still in contact with them with continuous exchanges and continuous um, hearings and conferences and, and events. And uh, we try to be uh, to, to, to keep this, this contact with, uh, with the business sector, uh, let's say, uh, with this, uh, small companies, uh, small and medium enterprises, let's say, um, just not to lose uh, yeah, the contact with, uh, with, with makers, let's say. So I think they are still on board and we will uh, definitely uh, keep them uh, as close as possible. Uh, Claire from our online audience has got a question for you, Lorenzo, but I'm actually going to ask the question to all of you, but starting with you, Lorenzo. Uh, the question is, um, how do you assess whether something has achieved beauty or not? Do you have a framework? Do you have a, a, a tick box? Do you have a, an yeah. app or some kind of scanner? How do you, yes. how do you tell? Do you score yeah. it out of 100? Yes, uh, actually, this is something uh, which I'm working on with my team. Uh, as I was saying at the closing of my presentation, we're working on this kind of self-assessment tool um, for um, yeah, uh, help and uh, support people to understand with a checklist what is uh, still important to do uh, for their design. Um, we are not inventing anything new. Uh, our research started um, with uh, uh, Davos uh, tour uh, system. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but um, Davos is, uh, it works like, like a self-assessment tool. So it presents uh, a list of questions um, that can be applied to anything really. It could be a building, could be a square or a park or um, a social initiative, for example. And the questions uh, help the designer to uh, understand um, if he remembered to, he remembered or he or she remembered to um, do everything that was necessary to create uh, a future-proof uh, space. So Davos has uh, eight criteria, I think. Uh, beauty and aesthetic is one of them, but there are also uh, togetherness and um, uh, economy, uh, resilience, uh, etc. So we are starting from that to uh, extract some important questions and we will integrate them with the findings that we, we collected uh, along the co-design phase. So this is the plan for us. Okay, same question to you, Mary. How do you tell if, some, if a space or a place or a development has, has made it in the beauty stakes? Yeah, I, mean, I don't think we can ever sort of have a checklist for beauty because as we've all said, there is that degree of, of subjectivity. I think there's some really good um, ways of, of sort of trying to build in um, good development principles. There's building for a healthier life. Um, the government produced the National um, Design Guide, which looks at the components of successful places. So I think it's making sure all of the ingredients are there. And just going back to the, the previous point about the sort of role of architecture, it's not saying that that I, yeah, I work with some absolutely amazing architects, um, but they tell me the story of the place before they show me the design of the buildings. So they tell me how it's going to work, how it's going to connect to existing communities, how you know children are going to walk to school. They tell me about the character and the landscape. And then when they show me the buildings, you get that, yeah, they're right. They fit in their context. So I think it's a, it's a process and a way of sort of layering your understanding of a site rather than just parachuting in, you know, a design from day one and then then trying to retrofit building for a healthier life or whatever around it. It's very much how the place works. And no checklist. Same question to you, Dana. How do you how do you judge whether your development was a success? And I'm going to a second question for you. Have you ever got it wrong? Have you ever finished a project and thought, oh my God, we really messed up on that. That is <laughs> Definitely, I would say. Maybe the architects will not admit it, but I would say, yes, we did get it wrong. Uh, sometimes projects start, start, you know, many years before they actually get completed. You know, we have a building in Amsterdam um, that we're not particularly in love with because the design started 10 years ago. It has been realized a couple of years ago. And since then, things have changed in the way that we, we see, you know, the way the building should look like. Organization of space, you know, circulation, all of that still works, of course. The client is in 
love with the building and that's important. And the employees who work in that building uh, enjoy working there, but you know, we probably could have done things differently. But I, I think to answer to your question, um, you know, we, we had a post-occupancy kind of analysis team that goes into our buildings years after they're, they've been uh, constructed and, and do interviews and also check, you know, how does the building perform and how does the public place perform uh, performs and, and, and all of that. And this is a very important team. But I would say this, you know, we look at social media a lot and we look at how people tag our buildings and our places. And when we see, like in the in the case of Arnhem, Cent Arnhem Central Station, uh, a station a master plan that we did and completed a couple of years ago in the south of the Netherlands. When we see people having photo shoots there for fashion magazines and they do a sports uh, group in the station or around it, uh, uh, there's dance classes uh, taking place at the station. When we see people do that, we know that we have done something right, right? It's, it's not up to us. We delivered the project and now people own it. And when they own it in the way that they imagine and feel free and safe um, to do whatever they need there, I feel that we succeeded. Uh, so Instagram is the ultimate arbiter of beauty. We've got two minutes left. So I'm going to ask you all a very quick question. Please keep your answers as short as possible. Um, you may not want to answer them, but that's up to you. Can you quickly all name a place that you think is beautiful and also a place that you think is really ugly? Lorenzo, your first. Spotlight's on you. Um, well, you can just God. go for the beautiful one if you want. Okay, all right. I could think, uh, I mean, I'm Italian, so my thoughts uh, immediately go to any really uh, Italian square, for example. I think they really embody the sense of being together and uh, shopping together, being with your family, uh, play with your children, uh, and be in a nice uh, architectural environment. So I would definitely think about, yeah, uh, the square of a small city in Italy. Italian squares, and obviously uh, there would have to be Italian food and wine along with that, I would say. Yes. Mary? I'm going to probably go for a controversial one. There is a scheme called Park Hill in Sheffield, which is, uh, it was the biggest listed building in Europe. It was 900 deck access council flats, uh, very brutalist architecture, um, loathed by many. So I'm going for ugly and beauty together because I think I had the chance to work with the developer Urban Splash, who have transformed that because they've really thought about how people can live there and how the original design, which really was about opportunity and post-war, you know, new, new future, they've actually given it style, purpose, community, and they've even had it as a backdrop on Doctor Who. So they took something that was ugly and unloved and really thought about people and design and transformed it into something special. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm not sure, do we have time for Dana? Crew, do we have Dana? No. Quick, quick answer from Dana, quick one. I would say Amsterdam streets, not the canals, but the streets, because people bring a chair outside their door, they bring some plants, they decorate it as the way they want to, and they turn it into, as I said, an extension of their of their living rooms and a safe space to put their babies uh, outside. So every street in Amsterdam is just a joy to, to walk through. Okay, thank you all very, very much. And that, I think that was a beautiful conversation, by the way. Anna, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you, Marcus. This was a really beautiful conversation and uh, inspiring uh, uh, all through. And I like the ending where you have to mention a beautiful and, a, and an ugly uh, the building or a spot. Uh, and Could I like Mary's, uh, Mary's Could suggestion. Could ask the same question to you, Anna, if there's yeah. time? Yeah. Uh, well... I think maybe uh, the most beautiful uh, building in the whole world, if you ask me, is the Sydney Opera by Utzon, because he's Danish as well. And there are so many ugly buildings, it's hard to choose. But I would have <laughs> to say most of the shopping centers around the world in all the sort of uh, semi-industrial areas before you enter the big cities is quite hideous. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's been great um, talking to you again and um, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Marcus. Thank you. Bye.